Hi everyone, my name is Rebecca, I'm a fish biologist and ichthyologist and also a PhD student. I specialise and study the evolution of lower cards catfishes, um, which are also known as like plex, whiptail catfishes and under similar names in the aquarium trade. Uh, but today I'm going to talk about actually one of their relatives and this is the family Calic, um, day. Technically, more specifically, Corydoridinae, which is um, probably well known with the genus Corydoras, but we've also got like Hoplosoma, Osteogaster, um, Gastrodermis, Vocus. If you're not familiar with these, they have been revised, and I'll put the revision in the description because Corydoras has been split up, revising and bringing back Vocus. Um, also putting quite a few different corridors into Bocas that maybe people weren't familiar with being in Bocas but also um, resurrecting Hoplosoma, Gastrodermis and a few others um, it hasn't really done much with uh, Scalera Mystax but has revised one um, one of the Aspidoras is now in I think it might be Gastrodermis I can't quite remember I'm not all, I'm familiar with the fish's biology, some of the taxonomy of Corydoridinae is a little bit tricky. Um, but I'll give loads of links for different resources that are really good with them because there's so many really enthusiastic people when it comes to Corydoridinae. So Corydoridinae is actually the uh, subfamily, or yeah, so it'd be the subfamily. It is split up, I believe, probably still into Corydoridinae which is uh, Corydorus, Hoplosoma, all of those. Then Aspidoridinae is Scleromystax and Aspidorus, which aren't really relevant here because I don't think they're actually venomous. So that's kind of a, So today I'm actually going to talk about Corydorus um, or Corydoridinae are actually venomous fishes. Many catfishes are venomous. And it is kind of tricky to say whether they're venomous or poisonous because it depends on how um, you interact with it. Obviously it's poisonous if you eat it and it causes an issue, so if you eat the compound and it causes damage, pain, something like that. Pain is usually caused by damage or if it's in injected into you then it's a venom. It can act in both ways, largely it's injected as a venom into people and into other fishes, but it can also act as a poison. So, the, it's difficult to say how many of the Corydoridinae are, well, how much of the Corydoridinae, so that's the, so exclude Aspidorus and Scleromysex for this video, but how many of them are actually venomous? We know Hoplosoma is, we know Corydorus is. We can probably assume Osteogaster, um, gastrodermis and there's another one which has um, a really um, difficult to pronounce name but I can't remember off the top of my head and then also brokers how many of them are venomous we definitely know it's quite um, well well noted in Corydorus which is lineage one and also in quite a few of the Hoplosoma which does include Sturbi that Sturbi was noted for being uh, particularly venomous or uh, particularly potent by many hobbyists when they've been stung by these fishes. So now we know we've, we've got, they are venomous and there's actually been some studies on it and including a PhD student has researched these fish and I'll link the thesis below and any papers I can find on it. Also um, Eric Thomas at University of the West Pacific also studies the, um, this topic and it has been featured in um, Ian Fuller's book. So, so in Ian Fuller's and Hans Evers' new book, there is a whole chapter on venom or poisoning in Corydoridinae or Corydorus, um, or Corydoridinae, I guess. And that sort of covers more detailed biology, especially if you like it written down, but anyone enthusiastic about this book, it does go through all different species, the CW numbers and the C numbers when it comes to Corydoridinae and some really good photos. So I do recommend it for more detail. Um, and it's also got ecology and stuff like that. But this does include a little bit more detail and it's more approachable for the hobbyist um, 
opposed to sometimes scientific papers or theses. So if you're interested in reading a bit more, I definitely recommend that book. It's available in the, definitely the UK and the USA. I am not sure how the situation is in other countries. I assume Germany, it's quite easy to get and across the EU. So anyway, where is the venom gland on these fishes? So the venom gland is actually located um, just sort of under, behind the pectoral fin. Some catfishes I think have dorsal venom glands or they seem to excrete some uh, venom or poison through the dorsal region whereas in Choidoridinae it seems to be specifically in the pectoral fin or just behind the pectoral fin. So it, through a few different studies they have looked at the morphology of these pectoral fins and it does seem to kind of function a little bit like a needle. If it's going to inject the venom, it's going to sort of be channeled through, it seems. But I guess that sometimes, I don't know, but that's kind of, so it kind of gets injected through that pectoral fin. I guess a scrape you might not get it as badly. But when they self-poison, it's actually secreted behind that pectoral fin, so sort of direct into the water, and you can see that hazy uh, liquid come out. It's very rare you'll probably actually see it, because normally you just see the after effects. But there is some photos or footage around of Choidoridinate secreting the poison um, from these venom poison glands. So why would these fishes actually secrete poison and venom? It's kind of, I guess, most people will be able to understand why. It's largely for protection. Uh, if something's got them in their mouth, they're going to secrete a noxious or unsavoury, untasteful sort of substance. Hopefully it means that that fish, that other animal will open its mouth and they can get out. It could also be a little bit of um, defence of pre being eaten. They do have very large spines, so they're going to be painful to eat anyway. Um, and some of these pectoral spines do lock, or a lot of the different, um, I think most of the Corridoridinae uh, pectoral spines lock, so those pectoral fins, side fins, are locked in position. So, it's... Um, yeah, so they largely for defence, but it's quite interesting when you see sparring ones. I don't think they use it on each other. The self-poisoning thing, though, is a little bit more difficult to understand because it, it wouldn't really work in a natural environment. It doesn't really work in an aquarium because when they're in the aquarium, it's a self-contained space, but it, the poison isn't that um, toxic or um, potent that it needs like only a small amount for a large amount of space. It happens in bags or if you're dripping them, so very enclosed spaces. It might just be just part of how the venom works and it's a sort of a hazard of having that venom or poison and it acts um, in captivity different to how you'd ideally have it in the wild. But they do release it when stressed, so there's probably a little bit more to the behaviour of it. So one question a lot of people ask is how toxic is it? And so it really, it's not going to be that bad. I, most people will say they get a little bit of swelling, a little bit of pain, but it's not enough to cause particular damage. That pectoral, fine spin, that pectoral fin spine is serrated normally. Um, in quite a few anyway. I don't think all have serrations, but that means that it's going to cause a lot of damage to actually come out. So that is probably going to be part of the pain, part of the um, swelling if it's getting sort of more stuck in there. But it's not particularly bad. And there has been discussion of some species, some genera being worse than others. I believe the potency isn't actually, it doesn't differ particularly between Corydorus and Hoplosoma as per um, Emily Phelps's thesis, although the toxicity does vary a little bit. I think, can't remember whether it does, uh, one being particularly more 
um, toxic, but it does differ slightly. So it's worth thinking about that they are poisonous, venomous. It's not just these guys when it comes to um, catfishes. There's loads of venomous catfishes, uh, such as Cynodontis, I think quite a few Pimnidae might be. Um, a lot of the sea catfishes, the marine catfishes, or sometimes brackish catfishes are particularly venomous, so Plotosa, Plotosidae, um, Aridae, they are much more venomous and going to cause much more damage and pain. But these guys, it's just sort of a mild kind of bee sting, but it might be worth noting. It has sometimes been mentioned that the actual structure of this poison, this venom, is similar to bee stings. So I would be just cautious with it. I wouldn't go around handling these fishes to get stung or anything like that. So yes, they can sting you and it um, can be painful. So how to prevent it? Sadly, you probably most people have to net Corydoridinae. Uh, they can be a challenge to catch, they can be quite smart. The only issue with nets is they can easily get trapped in it, so finding nets that prevent them being trapped is probably your best course of action. Alternatively, using cups, um, measuring, um, measuring cups, I guess. Those are the things to catch the fishes would be a much better and safer option for you and the fish. Um, it is quite tricky and nets try and go for no, nets that are less likely for the fish to get stuck because if the fish get stuck you're also more likely to get stuck because you're getting them out of the net. Um, but try to avoid handling them, unlike uh, lower cards, so plecos, they're not venomous at all, they've just got a lot of um, odonto spines so some can be particularly sharp. So one of the big questions a lot of people will have about this is because you might actually lose quite a lot of fish. How to actually prevent deaths of Corydoridinae within the aquarium? So one of the biggest causes I guess when it comes to shipping deaths or issues with this is that they will self poison and as I said it, will, it can be in the bag or it can be dripping. So there's multiple ways just to prevent it in general. Um, the biggest one would be bag them separately or maximum trios because then at least if you lose some, you lose one to three, you don't lose an entire batch. The more expensive the rarer they are, I guess you're going to want to bag them individually and think a little bit more about how you're bagging them. Some people will put carbon in the bag, I don't know if this works. Some people have also stressed out the fishes so they hopefully release the poison and then rebag them in new water. Um, I don't know how well either of those two work, I just prefer to bag them individually or maximum trios. It does take more time, it does take more space, but it's worth it because if you lose an entire bag, it does happen. I've had it several times and not just with Corridor Donate, some other catfishes have done it too. The other thing is dripping. I would not drip these fishes and pe many people say oh, I've had no issues dripping, I've never lost a fish. But see, it depends how often you've done it. If you've done it a lot, then you're going to start seeing trends. And these are kind of the fish I would just plop and drop in. Um, I do plop and drop all of the fish so they just literally, I get them out of the bag and in the water, a tank water straight away. Um, Dripping is really stressful for them and it's a prolonged stress with another stress as they go in the tank. So they kind of got two stresses. So I just add them straight to the tank and that means they're not going to self-poison because they're not dripping, they're not sitting there in a stress state in somewhere that might not have the greatest cover, might have people walking around. It's just better to put them straight in. And it means, yeah, it means you're less likely to lose them. So that is probably the main reason you'll probably see this. You're never gonna unless you do get stung, you're most likely gonna have issues if you um, are dripping them or shipping them. So try and ship them on their own or something like that and try not to drip them, which is <laughs> easy is 
I've never lost a fish just to plopping and dropping, especially if they're in the stress state, they want that fresh water. Um, if they're dripping, then it can also get pretty cold for them because that new water is kind of being a little bit exposed and then you got to heat them up again. I wouldn't float them either because, well, I think floating is a bit pointless because you're only acclimating temperature, nothing else. But then I would just add them to the tank they'd be fine. They're actually more hardy than they look, most of them. They just do stress. And you'll notice it because they kind of go on their side of their pectoral fin up and you, yeah. Um, I do have a photo, some of a specimen. I don't think I have any uh, self-poisoned specimens of Corridora Donado. But anyway, I'll end this video here. I'll add all the links to different um, websites and stuff like that that might be useful and any of the papers on the topic if you like my videos please comment like and subscribe and don't forget we have a discord server where we discuss anything scientific in fish keeping anything um interesting in fish keeping that's a little bit um less uh for the beginner and more for someone that's wanting to go into more advanced sides of fish keeping and also anything um regarding i guess more bearer fishes or anything like that. Anyway, thank you for watching and goodbye.